there. Um, we're going to continue reading Earth Dragon Awakes. 5.15 a.m. to 5.20 a.m. Early morning. Wednesday, April 18, 1906, underneath San Francisco. The earthquake makes the ground bounce up and down, twisting it back and forth like an old towel. Horses bolt into the street from the firehouses. On Mission Street, cattle are being herded from the docks to the slaughter yard. They stampede in terror. They trample and gore a man. One-sixth of the city is on landfill. Dirt, rocks, and debris have been dumped along the shore of the bay and into the creeks and ponds. Homes and apartments and stores have been built on top. Valencia Street was constructed this way. The earthquake tosses water from deep underground and mixes it with a landfill. The ground stops being solid then. This is called liquefaction. The soil becomes like quicksand and sucks entire houses down. That happens on Valencia Street. Even on more solid ground, buildings collapse like houses of cards. Thousands of people are trapped all over the city. 5.20 a.m. Wednesday, April 18th. 1906. Chin and Ah Sing's tenement, Chinatown. Chin cannot see. He cannot move. He can barely breathe. In the darkness, he hears his father cough. Are you all right, Chin? <coughs> his father is holding him tight. Chin tries to answer, but dust fills his mouth and throat, so he simply nods. Since his father can't see him, Chin squeezes his arm. Then he shifts around so he can raise one hand. He can feel the tabletop, but its legs have collapsed. Fallen pieces of ceiling and wall have turned the space into a tiny cave. His father pushes at the wreckage around him. It won't budge, he grunts. Chin shoves with him. The whole ceiling fell in on us. If his father hadn't pulled him under the table, he would have been crushed. But now, they are buried alive. Overhead, they hear footsteps. The earth dragon's mad, a man screeches in fear. Here, cries Ah Sing. Help us, Chin yells too. From nearby, someone hollers, fire! The footsteps run away. Chin and his father shout until they are hoarse. No one hears them, though. Trapped under the rubble, they will be buried alive. We'll have to rescue ourselves, his father says. Try to find a loose section. They squirm and wriggle. There is a big slab of plaster near Chin's head. He gropes with his hands until they feel the plaster. Powdery chunks crumble into his hands. He hears his father digging. Chin claws at the broken boards and plaster. Dust chokes their noses and throats. Still, they scrabble away like wild animals. Um, plaster is a thick white material. Um, you pour it, you can pour it into a mold. Some of you have made handprints or something else using plaster. The volcano that we made in class uh, was made from plaster. So it's a powdery material that you mix with, mix with water. When it dries, it becomes a solid. And in years ago, it was used to make walls. So that's why there's so much plaster falling down on them. 5.20 a.m., Wednesday, April 28, 1906. So this is at exactly the same time again, but it's in the Travis household, 
Sacramento Street area. Henry coughs in the swirling dust. Chimney bricks lie in heaps around him. A wall has disappeared. He can see right into his parents' bedroom, or what was their bedroom. It is gone now. So is the big chimney. Most of it toppled into their room. Their floor has given away under the weight and crashed below. His father pounds at the door. Henry, are you all right? He covers his mouth against the scented dust. All his mother's perfume bottles have broken. The house creaks and groans ominously. Sawyer yips in fears. Help me, begs Henry. His father's voice calms him. We'll get you out, Henry. I'm going to get a crowbar. You dress in the meantime. Henry obediently puts on his clothes. Though the house is still trembling, dressing gives him something to do. Then he scoops up Sawyer. Henry clutches his pet. The crowbar scrapes at the door frame. With a crack of wood, the door splinters and swings open. Henry sees his father, his nightshirt stuffed into his trousers. His mother stands behind his father. Her usually tidy hair is all tangled. She is wearing her silk shawl over her nightgown. His father hugs him. Thank goodness you're all right. His mother hugs him too. Then she cleans his face with her shawl. You're all dusty. So are you. Henry laughs with relief. They look through the hole in the wall. Yes, that could have been us in the next room, says his father. If the chimney had fallen the other way, it could have crushed you, his mother says. The house rumbles dangerously as they go downstairs. Henry carries Sawyer in his arms. The stairs sway under his feet. He hardly dares to breathe. Their house seems as if it will fall apart at any moment. Please hold together. He prays silently. Mr. Travis pauses by the living room. Mrs. Travis gives a cry when she sees it. Grandmother's piano has disappeared under a pile of bricks, board, and plaster. Then she squares her shoulder. At least we're alive, she says. That's the important thing. His father winds the little crank on their telephone on the hallway wall. Hello, operator. Hello, hello, he shouts into the mouthpiece. Finally, he hangs up the receiver. The lines must be down. The front door is jammed, too. His father pries at, pries at it with a crowbar. Sawyer barks from Henry's arms, urging Mr. Travis to hurry. At last, the door cracks off its hinges. Mr. Travis tugs the door open. They freeze in the doorway. Across the street, the front of the Smith's house has crumbled onto the road. However, the rooms are still intact. Trapped on the second floor, the Smiths are stunned. They stand stiffly like Henry's cousin's dolls in their toy house. An elderly couple, the Rosses, aren't so lucky. Their frame house down the block has collapsed on top of them. The whole street has split open. The cable car tracks have been twisted into strange shapes like shining wire. Some houses tilt at odd angles. They look as if they are peering over someone's shoulder. The pipes under the street have, been, have broken and water gushes out like a fountain. Henry squeezes his eyes shut. But when he opens them again, the nightmare is still there. 6 a.m. Wednesday, April 18, 1906. Chin and Ah Sing's Tenement, Chinatown. Chin and his father dig in the darkness. He just hopes they are digging out of the rubble. His arms ache and he is covered with cuts and bruises. Dust chokes his mouth and throat. He feels as if he cannot even breathe. The earth has swallowed them up. Fire! People cry from above. He feels the thumping of running feet, and he screams, let me out! His father stops digging and wraps his arms around him. Don't panic. But 
fear twists inside chin like a snake. Again, that's kind of a dragon image. He is so dry, he cannot even cry. He just lies there. His fingernails are broken, his fingers are bleeding, and they will never escape. He thinks about his mother. She won't know how they died. Suddenly, a breeze brushes his face like a soft hand, and he smells fresh air. He forgets his pain. He forgets he is tired. He scrapes at the wreckage, but he can make only a narrow tunnel. It is barely big enough for him. Don't worry about me, urges his father. Save yourself. I'll get help, Chin promises. You're the important one, his father says. Chin crawls up through the passage, leaving his father behind. He would be scared to be left alone in the darkness. Until now, he didn't realize how brave his father is or how much he loves Chin. Chin's hands break into the open. They flap frantically like the wings of a squared bird. There's someone alive, someone shouts in Chinese. All Chin can do is croak and answer. Above him, he hears feet. Someone starts to dig. Boards and bricks and plaster chunks thump to the side. Blindly, Chin helps his rescuer widen the hole. Strong hands grip his wrists. He feels himself rising until he sees Ah Quan's big grinning face. You're the biggest turnip I ever pulled up. Ah Quan laughs in relief. He hauls Chin onto the rubble. Chin has only one thought in mind. Father, he gasps and points below. As Ah Quan digs for his father, Chin manage, manages to spit out the plaster dust. Then he clears the debris, too. 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Wednesday, April 18, 1906, the Travis's house, Sacramento Street area. Henry's father organizes the rescues, rescuers. First, they find a ladder and get the Smiths out of their home. Then Mr. Travis leads everyone to the collapsed house. Sawyer jumps from Henry's arms. His dog barks excitedly at one spot. Henry crouches on the rubble. The Rossi's voices sound faint inside the ruins. Hurriedly, the rescuers lift away bricks and boards and plaster. Henry ties Sawyer to an, open, to an iron fence with a rope. Then he helps his father and mother go through the wreckage. Everyone freezes when the ground starts to shake again. A brick falls from a nearby building. When the trembling stops, they look around nervously. Mr. Travis calms everyone. We don't have time to be scared. There's too much to do. He ignores the danger and starts to dig. Henry thought that Marshall Earp was brave, but no outlaw was as deadly as nature. This is an even bigger battle, and his father doesn't back down. He joins his father. Mrs. Travis is right by him. Soon, everyone is digging again. These are ordinary people Henry sees every day. They're acting just like heroes, he says to his mother. Mrs. Travis throws a brick to the side. You can't judge a book by its cover, she says, meaning you really can't judge people by what you think they're like on the outside. Henry works until his back aches. He stands up for a moment to rest. To the south, a plume of black smoke rises high into the air and then curls like a question mark. I think there's a fire. Don't worry, said his father. We have the best fire department in the world. My house, one of the other neighbors cries. Smoke rises from his chimney three doors down. The fireman will be here soon, Mr. Travis insists. But he sends Mr. Smith to the nearest firehouse. Then he splits the rescuers into groups. Some stay with him to dig through the rubble. The others form a bucket brigade. Water spills from the broken water main. That is the big pipe that supplies water to the houses on the street. They fill buckets with water. 
Then they pass each bucket along to the head of the line, who throws the water on the flames. Another line passes the empty pail back again. The searchers finally find the Rossies under their heavy oak bread. Though it is broken, it has protected them. My father cut the tree down and made it himself, Mr. Rossi says. His arms is broken. His wife has a bad cut on her forehead, and it bleeds a lot. Mr. Travis flags down a surrey. A surrey is um, it's a, a carriage drawn by horses. He asked the driver of the little carriage to take the couple to the hospital. I'm busy, said the driver, but they need a doctor, Mr. Travis argues. Do I look like charity? The driver laughs. We'll walk there on our own, Mr. Rossi says, and stumbles to his feet. But Mr. Rossi is very old. Henry doubts he will get farther than a block. I'll pay you to take them. Whoops, I misread that. I'll pay you to take them, his father says. The driver scowls. Fifty dollars. That's robbery, his father splutters. The driver shrugs. I don't know what hospitals are still standing. I might have to drive a long way. Mr. Travis takes the money from his wallet. It is all that he has in there. They help the Rossies into the Surrey and watch them drive away. Trouble brings out the worst in some people, grumbles Mr. Travis. Trouble brings out the best in people, too, Mrs. Travis adds, and she points to the bucket brigade. And next time, we'll read about 10 or 12 more pages. See you later.